So number 20, and um, my computer is getting a little mad because I've been doing videos, so might hear the fan a little bit. But for number 20, I actually think it's one of the trickiest questions um, on this practice test because it says a metal ion has a net plus three charge. So plus three charge means that it has lost three electrons. So we don't know what this metal is. It's some metal with a three plus charge. Um, and it has six electrons in the 3D sublevel. So we're going to identify the metal. Now, keep in mind, it has lost three electrons. So it currently has six electrons after having lost three. Just remember that the 3D level has this weird relationship with the 4S level. Oftentimes, electrons will come from the 4S before they do the 3D. And there's like, you know, some exceptions and all that kind of stuff. They give all copper and cobalt and all those things. But... Knowing that, I'm actually going to remind you that this right here is the 4S, which is very close in energy to the 3D, which is this whole long section right here. So I'm going to write out just a select part of the orbital diagram. So here's the 4S, and then here is the 3D. Let's add six electrons to the 3D level. So we have up, 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 down. I left 4S empty on purpose because what you're looking at right now is the orbital diagram when it has already lost the three. So I gotta say that again. This right here is the orbital diagram for this ion because it says six electrons in the three. It doesn't say there's any certain amount in 4S. But from your experience, you may remember that oftentimes things will be lost from 4S before they're lost from 3D, or you know they'll, they'll borrow and all that kind of thing. So again, what you're seeing here is all we're really given, which is there are six electrons in the 3D sublevel. But remember, this is an ion, so it has lost three electrons. That means you're gonna have to work backwards and think, well, we make a reasonable assumption that whatever this ion is, it has lost three electrons. It has already given up its two S electrons. It's two four S electrons. So these two four S electrons were given up. They were lost. So since we're looking at a select part of the orbital diagram where it has already lost three electrons, let's actually add those three electrons back in when we remember that 4s would have been lost preferably first, right? So let's actually add those back. So to make this the neutral, the neutral metal, we're gonna make, we're gonna add in those two, we're gonna add in one right here. So now we have something that kind of makes some sense. Because what I just drew in orange, so these, oops, these are the electrons that would have gotten lost. So we kind of think backwards about this. This is some neutral metal, right? This is some neutral metal. And it, when it loses three electrons, it's going to lose the two in the 4S and then the most recent one in the 3D. That's how you end up with six electrons in the 3D. So in order to identify what the metal is, ask yourself what metal ends in 4s2 3d7 so you're adding the one electron back in to the 3d and then the two electrons back into the 4s and that's how i identify it now with that it's easy to see that the one that's going to be blah 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 4s2 3d7 is Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's cobalt. So that was a tricky question, tricky question because you had to go back and you also have to think about the fact that um, oftentimes electrons are lost from um, 4S, preferably, so to speak, because look at it's even slightly higher energy. You can even see it there. They're going to be lost from 4S. Um, well, not slightly higher. They're so close in energy that it just, that's why they're the transition metals. They're just weird. But if 
it doesn't make sense. Think to yourself, well, from the exception then the things that I know, 4S and 3D are really close in energy. So losing two from 4S and then losing that remaining, the, the third one from 3D makes sense. And that's why it's cobalt. So what we did was we basically worked backwards and we found that, well, this is the neutral one. Now imagine losing three electrons from this neutral cobalt. One, two, three. And that's why it ends up with six electrons in the 3D. You've already lost the two electrons in the 4S. So that's why the answer is cobalt. Number 21. Oh, goodness, we're so sick of the electron stuff, right? Now we get to do some energy, I guess. So this says the first step in the industrial recovery of zinc is a conversion of the sulfide to the oxide. So this is a equation where you have zinc sulfide and oxygen, zinc oxide and sulfur dioxide. This is the heat of the reaction, which is negative 790 or 879. This is exothermic. It gives off heat. You know it's exothermic because it's a negative symbol here. So it's giving off this much heat. What amount of heat is released when 150 grams of zinc react with excess oxygen? So this is basically called thermostoichiometry or thermochemical stoichiometry. You're going to start off with 150 grams of the zinc sulfide, and you're going to do normal stoichiometry, turning your grams of zinc sulfide into moles of zinc sulfide using the molar mass, which is given to us as 97.5 using your cancellations, we currently have moles of zinc. We, get, we would continue going forward and turn our moles of zinc sulfide into moles of, or actually, sorry, we can actually just go straight from moles of zinc sulfide into kilojoules because we have a relationship. For every two moles of zinc sulfide, this reaction evolves or gives off 879 kilojoules. So 879 kilojoules for every one mole or two moles of zinc sulfide. So we're using this two here from the coefficients and this, just like stoichiometry. And I'm going to do the math here just to make sure. So 150 times 879, divide that by 97.5 times 2. Yep, good. That's the right answer. So that's how basic the basics of thermochemical stoic work. You can also work it backwards. Sometimes you want to know, well, if this much heat or if some amount of heat is given off, how much reactant did you start with or how much product did you also make? It's just stoichiometry where you suddenly are using quantities as well as or amounts of a substance, so grams and moles. We turn our grams into moles, and then our moles into kilojoules using this equation. Number 22, the air within a piston equipped with a cylinder absorbs 800, or 565 joules of heat and expands, doing 68.8 joules of work. What is the change in the internal energy? So we have this equation here. The change in energy is equal to the heat plus the work. Now, from a chemistry perspective, when we're thinking about a gas expanding, it's giving up the ability to do more work, so it's losing work. That means that this 68.8 is a negative 68.8 joules because it expands. So this gas is expanding, and that's why it's a negative 68.8. But it, it, it is absorbing 565 joules of heat. So as a reminder, heat is the letter Q, and then work is, of course, the letter W. So plugging things in here, we get a positive 565. And we're going to add to that the negative 68.8. It's negative, again, because it's expanding. If, some, if a gas is expanding, it is losing the ability to expand more and more. So you can think of it as like it's losing work. And if a gas is compressed, then work is done on it and it can uh, theoretically expand again to lose its work. So that's why this math is the way it works. And the most important thing is for you to recognize that expanding is a negative work. And of course, absorbing and releasing heat, that's when, that one's pretty self-explanatory, but expanding is negative W and compression is positive W. So if 
This question said, the air within a piston equipped with the cylinder absorbs 567 joules of work and it were compressed, then it would be a positive value. So just know that difference. Uh, number 23, um, we have a gas C3, that's propane, C3H8 burns according to this reaction. So you have propane burning in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. This is a balanced combustion reaction. It's exothermic. The heat released from this reaction is used to boil water. What mass of propane, I don't know what LP means, liquid propane, something. But what mass of propane with this molar mass is necessary to heat 1.5 liters of water from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius? Assume that the heat released during the combustion, all of the heat, goes to the water. The density of water is 1, and the specific, the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184. There's a lot going on in this problem, but it's a combination of a couple things. First, you might want to tackle the 1.5 liters. Um, so 1.5 liters of water, I'm going to convert that to the mass of water. I'm going to convert my liters of water into milliliters of water. A um, 1,000 milliliters is one liter. Now I can convert my milliliters of water into grams of water because mass is what we need for these problems. So one, luckily water has a density of just one, so every one milliliter has a mass of just one gram. So that's easy, it's just equal to 1,500 grams of water. That is the mass. Now we also have the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.184. So we know the change in temperature as well. All of this, all this red stuff is going to help you get to this. Q is equal to MC delta T. Heat is equal to mass times the, the specific heat capacity times the change in temperature. We actually know all this stuff now. The mass of the water is 1,500 grams. The specific heat capacity of the water is 4.184 um, grams per, or joules per gram degree Celsius, and then the change in temperature is 75. You do not have to convert to Kelvin because it's a change in temperature. You can convert to Kelvin. It's still an increase of 75. So doing all that math, we get Q. So 1,500 times 4.184 times 75. That is 470,700 joules. That is basically just giving us, all, from this information, we have that this is how much energy it's, is needed to turn 1.5 liters of water up to 100 degrees Celsius from 25 degrees Celsius. So we're increasing the temperature of this water. We have a certain amount of the water, um, and that's how much energy it takes to do so. So that's just Q equals MC delta T. That's not your answer but it's going to help you get there because now you've got to do what we just saw in the last problem, which is thermochemical stoichiometry. So I want to shrink this down because we don't really need it much right now, but we certainly will need that, um, this value later. All right, so that was step one. Step two is now that you figured out how much energy is needed to turn this water from 25 degrees Celsius up to 100 degrees Celsius, you need to figure out, well, the energy is clearly coming from this reaction. You're burning propane. So in the burning of the propane, it's going to release negative. It's going to release energy. Assuming that pressure is constant, we remember learning that delta H is equal to Q. Uh, that's the enthalpy under constant pressure. So the change in heat for this system is going to go all into heating up this water up to the boiling temperature. So that means we're going to have to use stoichiometry now. So how much, what is the question asking again? Oh, what mass of propane do you even need? So we're going to work backwards. So we're asking the question, what mass of propane do you need to burn in order to produce this much heat? And that means we're going to start off with that much heat. So we have available to us 470,007 I wouldn't say available to us. We need to produce 470,700 joules 
of energy in order to get this water up that to that higher temperature. But notice how we have kilojoules here. So we're going to convert our joules into kilojoules. 1,000 joules is a joule, is a kilojoule. So we converted our joules into kilojoules. Now continuing on, I'm going to actually move this out of the way so we can use some of this space. So then, oops, we have kilojoules, and we're going to go from kilojoules to first moles. So now we're going, we're digging back into the problem. Um, let me change this color so I'm being consistent. Because this blue stuff is related to the problem. So we are going to go from kilojoules to moles. And remember, we only care about the moles of propane. So there's a big invisible one in front of the propane, which basically says that for every one mole of propane that we burn, this is coming straight from the equation, right? For every one mole of propane that we burn, we get 200 or 2,044 kilojoules. I'm not worried about the negative symbol because you cannot have a negative mass. So mathematically, there's no point in putting the negative sign in there. If you put a negative sign in here, because that's what it has right here, right? Then you'd get a negative mass, so that doesn't make any sense. Uh, so I'm getting rid of the negative sign. It's just an absolute value. So kilojoules been converted into moles of C3HA. At this point, you're probably familiar with the fact that we can easily turn moles of anything into grams. We're turning our moles of propane, C3H8, into grams of propane. Now we have the molar mass of propane. That's the whole point of the molar mass, remember, is to convert grams to moles or moles to grams. So we know that 44.1 grams of propane is how much one molar propane is. And then you do your math and you get to get your answer. So as a review of what we had to do, first we needed to figure out how much heat is necessary in order to get the temperature of this of 1.5 liters of water from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius. Now professor tried to be a little tricky by giving us the volume of water, but luckily water has a density of just one, so we turned our volume using our density into mass of water. Now the mass of the water was known, along with the specific heat capacity of the water and how hot the water had to get from its initial temperature. So we ended up finding out how much heat the water absorbed, basically. Now, the heat that the water absorbed came from the combustion of the propane, which we know is exothermic. You burn stuff like fossil fuels and you get heat out, which is why it's a negative sign. So all we did was figure out, well, how much propane do we have to burn in order to get this much energy? So we turned our joules into kilojoules, then our kilojoules of heat into moles of propane based on this equation. There's an invisible one and we used that. Nobody cared about the other stuff. And then we ended up finding our mass of propane. And once you run your numbers through with your math, being very careful, put that in parentheses if you need to, that would give you your answer. Number 24, you have a 15 gram piece of aluminum metal with a certain specific heat at 40 degrees Celsius and a 35 gram piece of copper metal with another specific heat at 60 degrees. The two metals are placed in contact with each other. Which of the following statements is true? select the single best answer. So with those true false statements, it's usually best to kind of just go statement by statement and see what happens. But it's also helpful to sketch it out. So let's see, we have 15 grams of aluminum and 35 grams of copper. So 15 grams of aluminum might look like this. And we have 35 grams of copper, so that's like slightly more than twice the amount. And that's 35 grams. Looking at their temperatures, um, you have 0. Point, or not their temperatures, but their initial. Oh, yeah, actually, you have the temperatures. Okay, cool. I'm going to put a little divider line here. So on the left, yeah, 40 degrees and 60 degrees. Okay, I'll do that in blue. So the aluminum is slightly cooler, it's 40 degrees Celsius. So. 40 degrees Celsius, and we ha has a specific heat of 0 0.900. Now, on the other side, you have warmer copper, 
um, it starts off at 60 degrees Celsius and it has a specific heat of 0 0.385. The main thing to recognize about specific heat is that a higher specific heat means it's more resistant to temperature change. So if it's hot, it stays warm compared to something with a lower specific heat. Same thing with um, being cooler. Think about the fact that water, the specific heat capacity of water is 4.184 joules gram degrees Celsius. Now that's actually a pretty high number, much higher than copper and aluminum. So if you think about water, water retains heat well. If it's warm, it slowly cools. If it's cool, it slowly warms. That's what the high specific heat capacity means. So knowing that, you can think about this fact. Aluminum is going to warm and cool more slowly than copper for every amount, for every uh, joule of heat added or removed. So that's what you can think about for these two specific heat capacities. That kind of gives you a conceptual basis. The two metals are placed in contact with each other. And just from like basic logic, you can imagine that the hotter metal is going to transfer some of its energy to the cooler metal because that's how thermodynamics works. So that kind of gives you the first part of your answer. Heat will flow from the copper to the aluminum because copper is hotter than the aluminum. So not the first answer. Heat will not flow from the aluminum to the copper. Heat doesn't flow from cool to warm. It flows from warm to cool. That's why so far these parts make sense. And also heat can't not flow because they are not in thermal, if they're in contact, they don't have the same temperature, they're not in thermal equilibrium. Um, okay, now what else is true? Because the aluminum have the higher specific heat capacity, well, we already know that's not a, that's not a good answer, so let's cross that out. Um, because copper has a larger mass, because copper has a larger specific heat capacity, also it doesn't, it literally says it doesn't, so that doesn't make any sense because this statement right here is false. And then it says heat will flow from the copper to the aluminum. That part is true because copper is warmer. And then it literally says because copper is at a higher temperature. So that makes sense. That's just basic like thermo. Higher temperatures will cool and warm, and lower temperatures will warm until they're at thermal equilibrium for two things in contact in a system. Now in terms of the rate of energy transfer that's kind of related to this the specific heat capacity but we're not asked about that here okay this one says determine the standard heat of reaction for the reaction this is hess's law um where you take multiple like elementary or different equations different chemical equations and you can create a new one so the way that i like to do these is i look at the equation and I look at the equation that we care about. So we care about this equation. And then I look at the elementary equations and I first identify, I use different colors for this, identify everything that we want to keep. So we want to keep H. And I see H here. We want to keep the bromine. And I see bromine here. The states of matter do matter as well as the subscripts. You can't just be like, oh, bromine, eh, that's kind of like that. No, that has a little too. It's not the same. But we do have a bromine here and then I also want to keep I'll do blue I also want to keep HBr which is here so Hess's law is really just about being very artfully manipulating things notice that I want to keep all the like the orange the blue the green and the blue but I also want to get them on the right side so what do you notice about this orange here for the H H needs to be on the left, which means that what I need to do for the second equation is, is I need to flip it. That's at least what I need to do. So the second equation needs to be flipped. So I'm going to put flip. The reason that we're going to flip the second equation is because we want to get the H to the other side. So I'm going to color code that. The point is to get the H to the other side. And I mean just H too, not H. I just mean H. I, okay, let me back up. I mean H. Just H also, not H2. I said two as in like T-O-O, -O, but that got a little confusing. So we don't, basically what I'm saying is we don't want H2 to survive. 
because it's not in the final equation we care about. We also don't want Br2 to survive. So we're going to take that second equation and flip it to get the orange H on the left. We also need to get the um, green equation, or I should say the green, oh, not that one. We also need to get bromine, um, this right here. We also need to get that on the left of the, of the yield arrow. So we're going to have to flip the second equation as well. So I'm just looking at what needs to flip. That's what my strategy typically is, is before I deal with coefficients and all that, I just want to look at, are my species even on the right side or the left side? Like, are they on the correct side? H needs to go to the left. BR needs to go to the left. But what do you notice about um, HBR? It's already on the right side, which is where it belongs. So we don't need to flip the first equation. But we do need to deal with our coefficients. So I guess I can call it, I guess you can say keep. And the reason that we're going to keep it, I'm going to put this blue circle here. That blue circle tells me I'm keeping this there because HBR is on the right and I want it on the right. So that's why that dot means don't do anything with the flipping and all that. So this whole column here is just kind of note keeping for me to tell me do I keep it or do I flip it just based on position. Then we have another thing we need to think about, which is the coefficients. Now we are... Mentally, we have moved things. Well, at least the second and the third one, we have flipped them over. So mentally, just kind of put, flip the positions. But don't do it for the first one. Now, when the positions are flipped, we look at our coefficients. For this H here, there is a big 1. There's an invisible 1. So it basically means we don't want a big 2. So that means we're going to cut this in half. Um, divide by 2 basically. That's for the second equation. For the first equation, we also need to divide by 2 because notice how there's no big 2 in front of HBr, but there is a big 2 in front of the HBr for this elementary equation. So we do need to divide this one by 2 as well. And for this last equation, which is dealing with bromine, flipping it around puts the bromine on the left, which is great. But notice how the bromine that we need does not have a big 2 in front, of the, in front of it. It does not have a coefficient 2, but this one does. So we need to divide that one by 2 as well. So all of them need to be divided by 2. When you divide or multiply by any coefficient, you do that to the heat as well. So personally, if you have the time when you're taking your test, I recommend you write it out again. Let's write out what the equations would be if we do these um, changes. We get a 1 half H2G plus a one-half Br2G yields a regular HBr. That is the first equation. I actually use probably, yeah, okay, I'll change it. I'll color code this part. That gives our HBr a single coefficient in front. Now, the second and the third one, we do need to flip. So all I did for the first equation was I just cut everything in half. That also needs, I guess I may as well also cut my delta H in half. So delta H is equal to negative 72.4 divided by 2. So I got negative 36.2. I'm going to move this over. I'm running out of room. There we go. Negative 36.2 kilojoules. What about the second equation? For the second equation, we flip it and we divide by 2. So I'm moving everything to the other side, which is actually pretty easy to do. I would get 2H um, gas, 2HG, yields H2G. That's just flipping it, but I also have to cut it in half. So that 2 gets cut into a 1, and then that 1 on this side gets cut into a half. What do we actually want to keep? Well, we want to keep this part, so I'm turning that to orange, wherever that is. There we go. Um, move this over here. And don't forget, we also do everything we need to do to the delta H as well. So for this reaction, we flipped it and cut it in half. So 436.4 
divided by 2, and we make it negative because it was positive, so it's negative 218.2 kilojoules. And then lastly, looking at that third equation, we needed to flip it and cut it also. So flipping it and cutting it, I'll do it in just one step for this one, I get BRG, and we have our, action, our yield arrow, and we have a half of a BR2, which is G. We wanted, of course, to keep the BRG, so that's going to be green. And then our delta H is going to do exactly what we needed it to do. We're going to flip it and cut it in half. So 192.5, divide that by 2, make it negative, and we get negative 96.25 kilojoules. Now here's the part that I think is super fun and exciting. Once you've done all your manipulations, you flip it, you cut it, you multiply it, whatever you got to do, double, verify that everything's going to go away that does not belong, or in this case, is not colored blue, green, or uh, orange. So hydrogen, half hydrogen on the left, right, done. Those cancel out. And then the bromines are also going to cancel out. So this just verifies that that happens. And you just add up all your H's to figure out what the heat of the reaction is. And then I'll give you your answer. Make sure I'm keep. Cool. Everything's good with that one. All right. 26. Which of the following reactions does the system have work done on it? So when something has work done on it, you can bet you can write out the work equation. Work is equal to negative P delta V. Um, if something has work done on it, you could basically think of it being compressed. Now, compression means you're going to have a change in volume. Volume is going to decrease, basically. So which of the following reactions does the system have work done on it? What I'm looking at is a system where the, there's a decrease in volume. What that means is you're going to have to look at just dealing with gases, by the way. Which one, count up your number of moles of gas on each side. So decrease in volume. That's what you're looking for. So let's count up our number of moles of gas on the left and the right. On the left of, and this one gives you the answer, but let's just count them up anyways. On the left, we have two moles of gas. On the right, we have zero moles of gas. So that seems good because we have two moles of gas turning into zero moles of gas. So we have a decrease in moles of gas. We know gases take up space. So if we have a decrease in moles of gas, we have a decrease in the volume of the gas. And only gases are your concern here because only gases are going to appreciably expand or contract. Um, this next one, we have how many moles of gas? Four on the left. And then on the right, ooh, I did not write my left and right right. Let's try that again. On the left, you have, well, still four moles of gas. And then on the right, you have six moles of gas. When I'm looking at the states of matter, obviously this six here is next to the um, species that has a G. Now four is less than six, so four went up to six. That would be an increase in volume. We don't want that. Another one. Um, on the left here, we have one plus one. So we have one mole of gas, one mole of gas. That's two moles of gas. On the right, we have also two moles of gas. So there is no change in the number of moles of gas. That one does not make sense. There was no work done on that system. Remember, we're looking for a decrease in volume. So that's why the first one's making sense so far. Um, for the next one, we have two plus four. There are six moles of gas on the, pro on the reactant side. And on the product side, we have one plus six. That is seven moles of gas. That's also an increase, which we don't want. We're looking for a decrease because remember, work done on something means it was compressed. And then last, we have um, one mole of gas on the reactant side, and we have two moles of gas on the product side. So again, that's an increase as well, not a valid answer. The only one that makes sense for compression or work being done on it is the first one. Now flip this question mentally and conceptually, which of the following reactions does a system do work? And then we'd be looking for an increase in volume. So in actually, that'd be the four answers with the X's through it. The four answers with the X's through it are all expanding because there's more moles of gas on the product side. 
than on the reactant side. So they would be doing work on their surroundings. The reason that the answer for this one, because it says work done on it and it's compressed, is because you have two going to zero. This question, number 27, says the gas expands, a gas expands in volume from 29 milliliters to 76.1 milliliters at constant temperature. Calculate the energy due to work if the gas expands against constant pressure of 1.90 atmospheres. First of all, for this question, we have a change in volume. So we have an expansion. That means that our change in volume is equal to our final volume minus our initial volume. We need to turn these milliliters into liters. So what that's gonna look like is we have 0 0.0761 liters minus 0 0.0290 liters. So that is your change in volume. And as we remember from our work equation, work is equal to negative P delta V. So we have our delta V right here. We already just figured that out. Got it. We also have the pressure against which it's working. So that's going to be P. So that's going to be constant pressure of 1.90 atm. There are a couple of places where people might get this question wrong. One of them is not remembering the equation. The other one is putting the Vs in the wrong order. Once you have the change in volume, which is, what is it? 0. We're actually just plugging the pressure. So the pressure is going to be negative 1.90. That's going to be here. And then the volume change, since it's an expansion, it's going to be a positive volume change. But remember, it's in liters. That's why I converted it to liters. It's a 0 0.0471. That's where this number is, in the purple. Now, when you do the math here, you're going to get not joules. You're actually going to get liter atmospheres or atmosphere liters. So what I originally get is 0 0.08949. Those are liter atmospheres. Very tempting number, right? But what you need to do is convert that. So what we're going to do is convert. Let's duplicate. We're going to convert that many liter atmospheres, and we're actually given the conversion factor here. So we're going to convert liter atmospheres from liter atmospheres into joules. And we're given a conversion that says that 101.3 joules is equal to a liter atmosphere. And when you do your math, you're going to get your answer.